now we'll start talking about each of the specific categories of major mental disorders, uh, taking into account all the caveats and issues that we raised before. Anxiety disorders are divided into these different kind of subcategories. So there's kind of this general case, generalized anxiety disorder, that's kind of a broad, uh, uh, just overall kind of high level of anxiety. Um, and so it's diagnosed in terms of uh, excessive, uh, difficult to control levels of anxiety and worry. It, it, it's characterized by kind of restlessness, difficulty concentrating, going blank, irritability, mun muscle tension, just kind of like a really um, high level of overall anxiety. That's distinct from more kind of phasic specific forms of anxiety, like a panic attack disorder. Uh, so basically uh, just kind of periods somewhat semi kind of unpredictable periods of just an overwhelming subjective feeling of terror. Uh, these last maybe on the order of about 10 minutes. That also kind of leads into this uh, panic disorder, which is actually associated with essentially the fear of having these kind of unexpected panic attacks. And uh, also associated with that is uh, uh, this phobia that is agoraphobia, going back to the, the Greek uh, agora, kind of these open air uh, markets. Uh, and um, and so it's actually a, a fear of uh, kind of uh, public uh, spaces or something where essentially if you had a panic attack in that environment, it would be very embarrassing and hard to deal with. And so people avoid them. Uh, so kind of a, a cluster of things associated with this essentially uncontrolled panic attacks. Um, and then uh, much more common, uh, but typically not rising to the level of uh, an actual kind of diagnosable, uh, you know, level of personal distress uh, is phobias. Uh, very common to have fear of snakes and spiders and bugs and all kinds of things like that. Claustrophobia. Uh, these kinds of things are very common, but again, typically people can uh, avoid those and not uh, create significant problems. But if it does raise rise to the level of uh, uh, something that's actually impairing. Uh, daily function and causing significant personal distress, then there are actually, uh, that's when it rises to the level of a disorder. And then there are various treatments that can be used for those. Depression is the next most kind of common uh, disorder. According to DSM-5, you have to have five or more uh, of these different uh, kind of symptoms. And again, you can really see where the, the, uh, the categories really are useful in terms of clustering these different symptoms. And then you must include the first two of these. So depressed mood, which is kind of, okay, yep. And loss of interest or pleasure. So some kind of real, uh, you know, a change in the overall kind of appetitive, positive aspect of behavior uh, and experience. And then some amount of these other symptoms. Okay. And again, you have to have a total of essentially three uh, additional factors that kind of, you know, make sure that it's not just uh, these two. So weight, appetite change, disturbed sleep, sort of kind of in indexing the severity of the overall disorder. Lethargy, agitation, fatigue, loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness, guilt, difficulty concentrating and decision-making, recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. So um, again, it's, it's fairly intuitive. And I think, you know, it, yeah, I I'm not a clinical Psychologist, I have no training in this area, but you know, I assume that when you get trained in in clinical psychology, you know, you learn how to apply these categories in a kind of you know expert way. Uh, whereas you know, a lay person just looking at these might you know check a list or something. But there's ways of assessing the degree and and extent of these things to uh, to really make a diagnosis. And as we've emphasized, uh, it really seems like uh, depression is this kind of associated with this core kind of loss of control, uh, this vicious cycle uh, that is, you know, uh, underlying this kind of uh, attractor network state kind of idea of, of what's going on with these disorders. So you have some kind of negative impact, negative affect, some kind of negative situation that happens. Um, and then uh, that makes it difficult for you to engage uh, kind of this standard kind of goal-driven cognitive control system 
Uh, and then that further leads to additional levels of negative affect, feeling of lower self-worth, lower self-efficacy, hopelessness as a general kind of category. Um, and so, you know, that just kind of that negative vicious cycle. One categorization here is the Beck negative cognitive triad, bad thoughts about the self, about the world, and about the future. Uh, another key term here is anhedonia, the inability to experience pleasure. So all of these are different kind of uh, factors uh, associated with depression. Okay, so given the prevalence of depression, uh, and and it's, it's kind of the key target area where these kind of pharmacological uh, uh, treatments, especially the, the Prozac kind of serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors have been uh, most applied and also most controversial. So we're just going to take a quick look here at the uh, a few studies looking at these kinds of treatments. And so this is comparing uh, MBCT, okay, and so this is uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Uh, from a study from Sona Dimijin and colleagues, that they're comparing the effects, the efficacy of this therapy-based treatment to uh, kind of uh, antidepressant medication, so basically Prozac kind of substances. And so what you see here in blue is the antidepressant medication, red is the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and this is called a uh, kind of survival graph in medical terminology. Uh, in this case, it's just, you know, not really survival per se, but uh, essentially how how long in time before you suffer some kind of relapse of depression. And so here uh, having a, a, a bar, having the line be higher means that in fact, uh, people who got the uh, mindfulness-based therapy um, relapsed less frequently than people who took the uh, medication. So in this case, we see clearly that the mindfulness-based therapy is actually more effective than the medication. Uh, here's a kind of review of a bunch of different studies, also comparing uh, cognitive-based therapy, so similar to the mindfulness-based, but not including the mindfulness aspect, um, and uh, looking at the Beck Depression Inventory, uh, standard measure of uh, depression severity, and you can see overall that in general, cognitive therapy reduce, results in less uh, uh, subsequent depression than antidepressant medication. So uh, two cases where we see uh, indications of benefits for therapy that exceed that of medication. Uh, here's another more recent uh, lit review looking at a wide variety of different potential treatments. And uh, here you have uh, basically the second generation antidepressants uh, at the top row. And this kind of uh, line here, they had a huge number of participants. It's widely prescribed, widely taken, a large number of studies. And so the error bar is the confidence level uh, in this case is low. And so there is some benefit benefit uh, being indicated uh, by being kind of above uh, this central line here around zero, uh, showing kind of some kind of effect size uh, reduction of the overall symptoms in this kind of, this is the negative axis. And so here again, you see that CBT across different studies has kind of a wider range. It's a much smaller number of studies that they included in this, uh, in this particular uh, meta-analysis, but uh, you know, it's at the same kind of general scale as the, uh, this, the second generation SSRIs. Uh, and then you can look at a variety of other things. Interestingly, St. John's Wort actually looks pretty effective. Uh, interestingly, there, uh, you know, a, a large number of other possible things that people talk about um, having kind of a very wide range of error bars, very few trials, and so not really enough data to really evaluate st uh, stringently the overall efficacy. Uh, and some of these things down here, it's kind of alternative uh, treatments that they looked at uh, really uh, just don't have enough evidence to really support them, but, you know, potentially some effects here. Basically, if you look at kind of what's really been demonstrated to be effective, it is essentially these SSRI uh, medications and uh, this small set of other things. These are uh, tricyclic antidepressant, uh, kind of first-generation antidepressants, by the way, here. 
the thing is about these SSRIs is that serotonin is an extremely complicated system. And yes, it is definitely involved in mood. It's clearly an important player in what's going on in these brain states. But there's so many different pathways that involve serotonin. This is 5-HT is serotonin. Um, they have kind of opposite effects. And so uh, there's also just so many side effects from taking these medications because serotonin plays such a critical role throughout the body in lots of different ways. And so, yeah, you can get some benefits from these medications, but essentially at what cost? And is it better in many cases to use something more targeted like these therapeutic approaches that have similar efficacy, sometimes better efficacy um, without the side effects? So that's the big question. And, and, you know, one really important thing that people I think are now starting to appreciate more, just because you get an effect by targeting the serotonin pathway, doesn't mean that the underlying cause of the disorder in the first place was based on a sort of chemical imbalance. Again, people really want to find this kind of uh, uh, disease model where, you know, everything's very simple, you know, something's out of whack biologically we go in, we fix it, and then the whole system is fixed, right? I mean, that's just the standard kind of medical disease model. And so people had assumed, oh yeah, you're, you're, you just have a chemical imbalance in your serotonin pathways. We're gonna go in and take this pill and it's gonna fix that. That is not likely to be the case for most people suffering from depression. Instead, the efficacy of these medications is mostly perhaps attributable to sort of essentially intervening in that uh, vicious cycle, sort of breaking that cycle, giving people uh, some kind of jumpstart or better positive affective state. Um, and then that makes them kind of uh, uh, pops them out of that cycle and, and can get them back on more of a virtuous pathway.